This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Need to Hone and it is Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. Most of the time in this series are ranked cards throughout Magic's history based on how they have performed at Magic's highest competitive level. This time around I'm looking at Blue's iconic creature type, Sphinxes. Iconic is a term wizards use to refer to one super powerful creature type in each color. Sphinxes have served as the iconic blue creature type since at least 2013. These creatures appear at higher rarities for the most part and represent that color. One or two of them also appears in just about every set. They are different from representative races, which also represent their color, but are much more plentiful and tend to have their own culture and societies. For example, merfolk are the representative race for blue. I've already done top tens on dragons and hydras, which are respectively the red and green iconic creature types, and now I'm doing sphinxes. Sphinxes are blue's iconic creature type because they best represent what blue stands for, intelligence and knowledge. To be eligible for this list, a card has to have the Sphinx creature type or create a Sphinx creature token. In all, there were 57 cards that meet that criteria, and in this video, we'll talk about the 10 that have left the biggest mark on competitive magic. Before we get started, a quick reminder on how I score cards in these lists. Pro Tour and Mythic Championship Top 8s, as well as Legacy and Vintage Championship Top 8s are worth 2 points, and a Grand Prix Top 8 is worth 1 point. Now, let's get to number 10. At number 10, we have Dream Eater, a Sphinx who is still in standard right now. Dream Eater does a whole lot for 6 mana. It has flash and flying, surveils 4, and also bounces one of your opponent's non-land permanents to their hand. That is definitely 6 mana of value. An evasive threat that puts your opponent back on board and smooths out your next several draws is pretty amazing. Flavor-wise, surveil also does a really good job of conveying this particular Sphinx's thirst for knowledge. Despite that stuff though, the Dream Eater has never really caught on in Standard. Not yet anyway. It does have a lone point in the format from a Grand Prix Top 8 at Grand Prix Taipei in 2019, where it was played in a Grixis control deck. Since it is still in Standard now, it has some hope of moving up this list a little bit in the future. At number 9, it is Warrant, Warden. It is the only card to make the list that doesn't technically have the Sphinx creature type, however the Warden half can make a 4-4 Sphinx creature token. While 5 mana for that token isn't the greatest rate ever, the strength of this card comes from its flexibility. Most of the time, you probably find yourself using it as a removal spell. In other words, you cast the Warrant half. However, sometimes you just can't find one of the win conditions in your control deck, and it is time for you to play one. Luckily, this removal spell, unlike most of them, can then turn into your win condition when you make the Sphinx token. So far, Warrant Warden has 2 points in standard with 2 Grand Prix Top 8s, one in Jeskai Control and the other in Esper Control. Like Dream Eater, Warrant Warden has some time left in Standard and can certainly add to its score. At number 8, it is Sharoom, the Hegemon. Sharoom is the leader of Esper. She packs some serious power. A bit of that comes from the relatively imposing stats as a 6 mana 5 5 flyer, but her real power comes from her ability to bring back any artifact from your graveyard. This means that she's going to give you a 2 for 1 most of the time, and sometimes she can do straight up busted things, like when she gets back a super powerful artifact that it would be hard to cast normally. Sharoom only ever managed one Pro Tour Top 8 back in 2010, where it appeared in an artifact heavy deck called Open Filigree. Most of the cards in the deck were artifacts, and the deck had multiple ways to get them into the graveyard, so Sharoom had a lot she could bring back. But the ideal thing to do was to reanimate Filigree Angel, who would gain you a ton of life, and team up with Sharoom in the sky to beat the opponent down. At number 7, it is Sphinx of Dwar Isle. Like most Sphinxes, this one is a big, scary, flying creature. In addition to the big evasive body, Sphinx of Dwar Isle also brings Shroud to the battlefield, which means that it's not going to be easy to kill. Only board sweeping and sacrifice effects can kill it, so it represents a very real threat. Sphinx of Dwar Isle also gives you the additional upside of always knowing what the top card of your library is. Another effect that makes sense for a creature type that's interested in information. While the value of that might not seem like a lot, when it's already tacked on to a creature who is a very real win condition, it is some nice additional upside. It's not playing standard, particularly in Bant mid-range decks. It also has a single point from Extended appearing in the sideboard of a Thopter Depths combo deck. It could be sighted in against opponents who could effectively disrupt the combo and make them face down the Sphinx, which was something they couldn't do a whole lot to disrupt. At number 6, it is Sphinx of Foresight. 
There are a decent number of sphinxes out there who can scry, which is something that makes a lot of sense for these intellectual creatures. Sphinx of Foresight gives you an efficient 4-mana four 4-4 four, four flyer that scries for you every turn, which helps you improve your draws. But what really makes the Sphinx interesting is the fact that it can actually let you scry 3 before the game even really begins. That is some serious value, especially because you get it for 0 mana. The Sphinx can help you keep 7 card hands that might be a little bit risky, it can make it less risky to mulligan, because it just makes sure your first few draw steps are as good as they can possibly be. The Sphinx is seeing play in standard right now, in Jeskai Fires decks, decks looking to abuse the powerful enchantment Fires of Invention. Sphinx of Foresight goes a long way towards helping you make sure you have that key enchantment in your opening hand, or that you'll draw it soon. This is another Sphinx who isn't done in standard yet, and unlike Dream Eater and Warrant Warden who don't seem to have a clear home right now, Sphinx of Foresight just picked up two more points last weekend in Fires of Invention decks, so I think it's safe to assume that Sphinx of Foresight is going to continue to accumulate points in Standard. At number 5, it is Sphinx of Lost Truths, a Sphinx who can draw you a bunch of cards, which is yet another ability that conveys the intellect of Sphinxes. For 5 mana, this gives you a 5 mana 3-5 flyer that lets you loot through 3 cards. That's a pretty good deal already, especially for decks that like loading up their graveyard for various reasons, of course, the Sphinx also comes with Kicker, and if you can afford to pay 7, you get to keep those 3 cards, which is pretty powerful. Funnily enough though, everywhere the Sphinx has been played was not especially interested in kicking it, because those decks all wanted to take advantage of their graveyard. In Standard, it was played alongside Sharoom the Hegemon and Open Filigree decks, providing you with a way to load up your graveyard with powerful artifacts. It was also played alongside Sphinx of Jwar Isle and Bant Midrange decks, which, even without a graveyard sub-theme, were really interested in the card selection this Sphinx could give you. Extended was where the Sphinx could really be abused though, because you could combine it with the dredge mechanic to dump a bunch of your library into your graveyard, and that was exactly what those decks wanted to do. These days, there seems to be more effective ways to load up your graveyard than paying 5 mana, and as a result, the Sphinx hasn't seen play anywhere since 2011. At number 4, it is Sphinx of the Final Word. The Sphinx was a great win condition for control decks in Standard, since it was hard to kill thanks to Hexproof, could hit hard in the air, and made all your spells uncounterable. While it did earn 3 of its points as a main deck card in control decks in Standard, the other 8 points all came as a sideboard card to be brought in during control mirrors. Whichever control player could get the Sphinx into play first was going to win, because now they have the upper hand, since, you know, the player who controlled the Sphinx could still use counter magic, while the other player could not. It saw play in Teemer, Esper, and Grixis control decks. At number 3, it is Sphinx of the Steel Wind, yet another imposing Sphinx. Jammed full of keywords, Sphinx of the Steel Wind is incredibly powerful in a vacuum. Flying and lifelink makes it impossible to race, while Vigilance lets it hang back on defense. Meanwhile, First Strike means very few creatures can win in combat against it, and protection from green and red means that a huge chunk of cards don't even phase it, including cards that could usually very efficiently destroy an artifact creature like the Sphinx. So what's the downside here? Well, the Sphinx costs 8 mana, so finding a way to cast it isn't an easy task. As a result, it didn't see any play in standard. But in the non-rotating formats, there are plenty of ways to cheat the Sphinx into play early, something that is very hard for most opponents to recover from. In modern, this involved reanimating it with unburial rites. In Legacy, it also was put into play with reanimation spells, but also show and tell. And in Vintage, it has been brought into play early with Oath of Druids. It found a bit of success in all of these formats between 2010 and 2017, but unfortunately for the Sphinx, over the years it seems to have been largely usurped by Gristlebrand as everyone's favorite reanimation target, and I'm not sure it will ever be able to improve its position on this list. At number 2, it is Prognostic Sphinx. This is another Sphinx who can scry for you, Something that is particularly apt in this case, since this Sphinx can apparently tell the future, and scrying is a good way of conveying that, as we also saw in Sphinx of Foresight. In addition, Prognostic Sphinx can also gain Hexproof when you need it to. Those two things together made Prognostic Sphinx a pretty attractive control deck win condition in both block and standard. It made sure you continued to draw whatever you needed to keep your opponent at bay, and in the meantime it could attack for 3 damage at a time while avoiding most removal spells. In block, it was played in Sultai control decks, and in standard, it was played in blue, black, and Jeskai control decks. And at number one, it is Consecrated Sphinx. Six mana for a 4 6 flyer may not be the most efficient deal ever, but the Consecrated Sphinx's passive ability is no joke. 
Anytime your opponent draws, you get to draw two cards. This means that at a minimum, you'll be drawing one card on your turn as normal, and then two on your opponent's turn. Even though the Sphinx is expensive and vulnerable, it doesn't have Shroud or Hexproof like some of the other Sphinxes we have seen, your opponent is basically never going to be able to trade profitably with it, since it will net you two cards before your opponent ever has a chance to kill it in most cases. This power is even more absurd in multiplayer formats that are not currently supported at Premier events like EDH, where you will be drawing even more cards. The ability to draw you tons of cards and serve as a win condition all on its own has allowed Consecrated Sphinx to find success in multiple formats. It found the most success in Standard, where it was played in several different control decks. It even has some points in Vintage, a format where lots of cheap card draw spells are around. It has been a couple of years since this Sphinx has gained any points, and there is some chance that some of the other cards still active on this list, in particular Sphinx of Foresight, could have a chance on catching it in the future. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to see the over 240 MTG Top 10s I've already done, you should see the link to the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.